Welcome to 7 Investing Now, a show that teaches you how to take a long-term view on investing by better understanding what's happening in the market now. Good afternoon, 7 Investors, and welcome to the Wednesday edition of 7 Investing Now. My name, of course, is Daniel Brooks Klein, and joining me uh, fresh off his sickbed, uh, we don't know what Simon Erickson is fighting, let's, let's just call it a flu-like disease. Simon, are you pumped up on like a weird mix of Dayquil and coffee, like how did you work this one out? That is exactly correct, Dan. The the flu bugs are biting hard down here in Houston, but like you said, I'm on Dayquil and coffee. This is going to be an interesting one. We'll see how it goes. Max, is it? Uh, and also joining us, of course, is Max Chasco. Max, is it weird that you're excited when your friends are sick and it's just the flu? Like, like is this a <laughs> is this a really strange turn of events where it's like, oh, like I, I don't have COVID, like it's just the flu, like. Yeah, I mean, that's a weird new thing, right? With the pandemic, we're probably gonna be in that for a couple of years, right? Um, everybody wear a mask around Simon. We don't know. You got to play it safe, right? I have quite the mask collection, uh, though I will switch to wearing a Lucha Libre style mask uh, when I go visit Simon. Here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the market has been selling off. We're going to call them growth stocks. We originally called them tech stocks, uh, but we're going to talk about biotech as well. So it really is a lot of growth stocks that are not doing well. We know there's a lot of concern in the market. We know there's a lot of investors that are heavily invested in these stocks. So we've got a bunch of your questions to take, uh, and we're happy to take whatever questions we can live. Simon is going to try to fight his way through the show, but just in case he doesn't make it, um, Simon, why don't you give us your, your 10,000 foot overview of what's happening in the market right now? Yeah, right. So Dan, this is textbook uh, sector rotation, what's going on right now, right? You've got institutional managers that have for years been risk on with low interest rates, uh, go for the gold, put, put your money in a tech stock that are rotating this to counterbalance that and put it into some names that are going to recover from the cyclical economy. Just to kind of clarify what that means, we've seen last year unemployment was at 15%. Now it's down about 6%. GDP in the US last year was negative 2% because of COVID. Now we're up to 6% GDP. So the economy is recovering. And so what do uh, fund managers with tens of billions of dollars at the disposal want to do? Well, they say, let's take some risk off the table. Let's take a lot of this out of those higher growth, higher flyer names. Uh, who have a lot of their cash flows in the future that have benefited from really low interest rates. And let's put it into more cyclical recovery names, the companies like the Lowe's, the Home Depot's, the kind of things that you'd see in the Dow Jones. We're starting to see a, a, sec a sector rotation. This is completely normal for the cycles of the market that follows the economy. And Simon, and I'll come to you, Max, in a second. So some of this is also, there was sort of like a, a fervor over certain stocks. Like, you know, about Zoom and Teladoc are, are two great examples. We've talked about these a lot, but these were stocks that pulled growth forward from the pandemic. I think it's fair to say that with the pandemic, you know, sort of ending, it's it's largely normal here in Florida. I mean, most things are, and everything's open. Most things you can go to uh, even without a mask in some cases, if it's outside. Um, you're not going to see the hyper growth and that's spooking some investors. Is that a reasonable take on it? Well, I think that the tech sector um, experiences the hype cycle a lot more than a lot of other sectors of the stock market, right? We, we get so excited sometimes about things and we put unrealistic price tags on them. We saw this with uh, with marijuana companies a couple of years ago. We saw this with virtual reality companies a couple of years ago. Uh, Max, I would even say we're seeing this with a lot of electric vehicle companies right now, right? Companies that are exposed to things that make a lot of headlines. Sometimes we get really far ahead of ourselves in terms of the valuations for those. But I also don't want to discount the fact that a lot of these tech names, even the ones that are selling off today, are actually still in the early stages of long-term developing trends that are just now kind of at the tip of the iceberg of what the value that is created for investors are likely to achieve. Uh, we hear a lot about the digital transformation. That's kind of the buzzword of people moving their workflows and their data from on-premise data centers to the cloud. And the companies that are taking advantage of that, software as a service, infrastructure, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, anything as a service now that you're getting from cloud-based providers, that is still less than 10% of global IT workloads have moved there. And so when we're talking about these companies that are selling, oh, it's 25 times sales, it's 30 times price to sales multiples, uh, those are selling off because a lot of tech names are selling off. I would take the other side of that coin and say it's justifiable for a premium because you're still at uh, the denominator of a lot of those of those valuation multiples are still at the very, very early innings. And I'll argue, and I'll throw it to Max in a second, that those high-flying tech stocks are performing a lot like Netflix has during the pandemic, where 
Netflix got this huge rush of subscribers and then last quarter had a bad quarter. But if you zoom out and look at their five quarter growth total, the numbers are astounding. So I think that's what you're going to have to do with the, the Fastly's and the Zooms and the Teladoc and Octon and CrowdStrike and some of these companies is don't look at it on a quarter by quarter basis because if they have three times the growth they expected in Q3, it's actually okay if they have much slower growth in Q4. Uh, it's really about adding the customers. But uh, Max, you're looking at this a little bit differently from uh, your, your perch in the biotech world. Yeah, so I guess just at the top, I mean, on the whole, um, you know, we have seen like the rotation that Simon was talking about, but in the last week, that's not been true. I mean, the Dow Jones has had some of its worst days just this week. Um, so I think all stocks are down. It's not just people running into Home Depot and all that, all those types of stocks. Uh, I think we're seeing across the board, people are trying to like figure out um, what does inflation mean? And it's not just because of pricing, you know, that, that when, when interest rates went from, you know, before the pandemic, they were two and a half percent range right down to near zero overnight. You know, that shifted a lot of pools of money in the economy around, right? Nobody's really in bonds anymore, or not nearly as much money anymore. That all flowed into equities. Some of that's now flowing into cryptocurrencies, of course, and maybe it'll flow back into equities eventually. So the pools of money are moving a little bit more than they have in the past. So uh, I think that's important to point out too when it comes to like concerns over inflation. Uh, Simon, were you going to weigh in there? I saw you unmute. Or no? <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect, Max. I just wanted to kind of add a point about what, what, how do, how do institutions think about valuation, right? Like, let's think about where, where the money is is moving hands right now and how they think about why, 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 why do this? Why move money around? Uh, so much of it is very quantitative. You know, if you've seen institutional um, DCFs, valuation multiples, things like this, uh, they're they're heavily weighted towards discount rates and movement of the economy. How, how is the economy doing, and what's the discount rate? And so last year, when we were stuck at home um, because of COVID, tech companies were shooting off the charts because everyone's glued to their desktop computers and their and their mobile phones. You saw that the results from tech were amazing. I mean, revenue growth and earnings growth was off the charts because there was no other place for people to do things. And then coupled with very, very low discount rates, this kind of made all the inputs the perfect storm for a lot of those shorter term price target valuation models we've gotten used to. Now it's a step back and say, okay, yeah, the valuations went up. Do you believe the growth story of these companies? Or is this going to be something that fades away, fades away because that growth is not sustainable? So you've definitely got to pick the wheat from the chaff on those tech companies. And, and we're going to let me, oh. let me jump in here, Max. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the different way we look at biotech and, and value compared to technology. But I want to jump in and, and answer Max's comment on the overall market being down. I think we're in a damned if you do, damned if you don't sentiment because there are some retailers, and I cover the retail space, that have put up tremendous numbers and they're getting the market saying, yeah, but you're not going to have growth like that a year from now. And it's like, well, okay, but I had a really good quarter and I added new customers. And you're, you're right. You know, you might not add 15% in same store sales or, or grow your, your customer base by 20% or whatever it is quarter after quarter. But just if you had that bonus, that gives you more money to invest. It, it, it tells your story. It moves it forward. So I do think there's going to be a catch up. I think there's a lot of companies that have done very, very well during the pandemic and their stocks have actually taken a beating. And at some point, the market will just go, these are really good companies. Max, sorry to step on you there. No, that's all right. And yeah, that, that actually leads right into my, my other point I was going to make here before we get into biotech. Um, you know, I have personally bought, I'm all tapped out now, dang it. But, uh, you know, so I have used this as a buying opportunity because, you know, we're oriented in the long term mindset, right? We're looking at three years, five years from now or longer. But just because stocks pull back, recently doesn't mean necessarily they're going to shoot right back up to where they were in February, March, right? For growth stocks. I think the recent pullback says a lot more about where valuations were uh, in February, March than it being necessarily like this epic buying opportunity. I think like what Dan was saying, uh, expectations are very high and they were. And I think even current valuations, even with a sell-off, uh, there's still a lot of high expectations baked into current valuations. Simon, what do you think? Yeah, there absolutely is, Max. But, you know, when we I think zoom out, like you said, is, is kind of the, the key here. Um, I'm going to be providing an advisor update here on the on the 15th and I won't go too into the details of it, but it's, it's based on a study done by Boston Consulting Group. It's one that I love every year about how value is created over the long term for investors. So if you think about this in terms of a couple of months or a couple of years, you say, oh, yeah, OK, well, there's money coming off the table here. There's a sector rotation here. Price to sales was at 30. Now it's only at 20. I lost a lot of money. But 
if you zoom out and you look at how companies, the best performing companies create value for you as a shareholder, the stock prices go up over long periods of time of five years or more. Uh, it is based really on two fundamental things. One is profitable revenue growth, and two is how companies deploy the cash flows that they're creating. Right. And I'll get more into those, but at the long term, it doesn't really, if you're thinking five years out, you don't care about the interim steps of where the market's doing with its money or what kind of sector rotation or valuation it wants to give. You've got to find best in class companies that are putting their money where their mouth is mouth is and and visionary leaders that are capturing those opportunities um so the best three performing companies in the last five years when you look at total shareholder returns it was uh shopify was number one amd was number two and square was number three and all of those are growth companies right those are companies that you could call tech companies that are out of favor right now but shopify's had an average annual compound annual growth rate of 113 percent per year and we've been calling it overvalued the entire way up. So it just kind of shows you um, how value gets created over the long term is out of touch with a lot of the headlines I think that we're seeing right now. Absolutely. And that was that's the point. I mean, don't don't buy today and expect in two months you're going to be up 50 percent or something. Right. You'd have realistic expectations and orient yourself towards the long haul. Yeah. And that's why what we do at Seven Investing is so important. Like we're actually putting the homework in and understanding the companies. And it isn't where a company is now. It's what roadmap they set out and did they tick off those points? And Max is going to talk about this a little bit when it comes to valuing biotech stocks. But I wanted to take the comment from Springer10, if you can bring that up, Sam. Uh, so all that being said, should we be buying? So I believe this is a buying opportunity for many stocks. There are stocks out there that you look at, uh, specifically in my space in retail, that have put up very, very good numbers. And have gone down and have gone down significantly. There's also some stocks in tech, you know, where you can look at the growth chart and say, okay, the market is punishing them because they only grew 47% last quarter and the, the analyst expected 52%. Well, some of those are really nitpicky kind of stupid things. But in tech, we look at growth, we look at revenue, but that's not really what you're, you're valuing biotech companies based on, Max. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, when you value tech and you look at price to sales ratios, even if those look pretty expensive, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're basically valuing in, um, you know, revenue projections. When you're valuing a biotech company or a drug developer, you're pricing in certain de-risking events like clinical trial results or the ability to scale a new drug product in the market. And that gets into like a little bit more crystal ball territory, Dan, because uh, clinical trials all the time, you know, they have mixed results. There's multiple endpoints, there's safety, there's efficacy. Sometimes the drug's very effective, but then there's some weird thing nobody saw coming uh, with the safety signal. And it kind of, maybe that program gets canned. Maybe the FDA has some more questions or delays it or makes you monitor patients for five more years. So all of these things, um, you know, aren't really, I guess the amount of risk isn't priced in, in my opinion, in biotech, even with some of the sell-offs. I mean, um, a lot of these elevations in certain areas as well, um, seem to be a little elevated still, in my opinion, um, certainly. I, I, and I don't know, I think like coming out of the pandemic, I think people are kind of like chest thumping, you know, yeah, we crushed the pandemic. We made vaccines in a year. We figured out biology and it's still very complicated, right? I think expectations for some of these newer therapeutic modalities are still a little too high. Uh, they're going to be humbled a little bit, but they're still like going to be with us. It's just, uh, you know, you can overpay. Um, so you have to be realistic. Um, kind of what Simon was saying earlier, you know, um, we kind of, get on the hype train a little bit too often in tech and biotech. And, um, you know, that, that can lead to unrealistic uh, expectations and, and maybe bad results in your portfolio if you're not uh, thinking with a long term mindset. We're going to get back to unrealistic expectations in a second. But before we do that, uh, Simon, we don't promote what we do all that much on this show, but we actually have something pretty special coming up a week from Friday. Uh, I was kind of hoping it was a team dinner, but it's not. Uh, <laughs> what exactly are we doing a week from Friday? Yeah, Dan, it's our subscriber call. We do, we do every month on the third Friday of the month. We actually interact directly with any of our subscribers that can join us. It's a live Zoom call on the spot. You can ask our advisors any questions you want. You can talk in the chat on the sidebar too. It's, it's kind of a lot of fun. We also make it available for anybody who's not able to make it. Uh, it is next Friday, starts at 11 o'clock Eastern time, which I'm told is the standard time zone of the United States for those on the East Coast. That's the uh, correct time. Yeah. <laughs> the correct time zone. The, the fun part about this one, Dan, is uh, I think that it goes back to Springer's question, which I loved that Springer's asking this, which is, you know, should we be buying? 
right? With all the analysis that Seven Investing does, with all the different markets you guys are looking at, what do I? What should I do? Should I be buying through this? And we encourage everybody to think of investing as a personal thing, right? Everyone's Max's answer isn't the right answer for Dan, which isn't the right answer for for me. But we're going to do something a little different on next Friday's call, uh, just because it's been such an interesting month. We've seen so much volatility. And we're going to invite any of our advisors who wants to, to speak up about one or two specific companies that they've personally been buying into. Uh, and I think that hopefully this doesn't kind of um, confuse that investing still is personal. And that's not always the right answer to just follow what someone else is doing. But to show that when we say, hey, think long term, buy and hold, this is an opportunity. Uh, we personally live that too. And we feel it when there's red ink in our portfolios. But we see this at if you're a long-term investor, you got to take advantage of opportunities like this. So we're going to make it a little bit more real, Dan, on yeah, our next it, Friday subscriber call. I actually think that's one of the joys of being a seven investor mem member. Uh, not just that call, but you know, you talk about well, Max's pick might not be for everybody, my pick. But as a member, as someone who watches Seven Investing now, you get to know us. You know, for example, that I'm married for a long time. I have a 17 year old kid. I like to travel a ton. Uh, I'm buying a resort condo. You know a lot about me. So you can apply how that you know is is like is like you. you you know that Max is single and he's chosen to live in Pittsburgh and and has made some other questionable life choice. No, I'm just kidding. And that, <laughs> but you get to know us, and as members, you get even more of that because you know we'll tell you what stocks we're buying and selling sometimes, or or give you in you know, a more insight into our portfolios than we necessarily would here on Seven Investing Now. So I won't belabor it. But if you'd like to be at that call, it is seveninvesting.com slash subscribe. Tell them Dan sent you. That's no actual place to do that. But uh, seveninvesting.com slash subscribe. $17 a month or the best deal out there, $170 a year. We do not take Bitcoin yet or any <laughs> cryptocurrency. We did have a really fun conversation about creating a cryptocurrency. We're not actually going to do that. Uh, but the fact that scam coin is already taken really upset me. So we will move <laughs> on. Simon, with tech stocks, we're going to get to some of your questions and comments. This is probably all we're going to talk about this show. I don't think we're going to do any other segments because there, there's really a lot of, of concern in the market. But Simon, with tech stocks, is some of this just investors having unrealistic expectations? I mean, you don't have to grow 130% every year to still be a growth company. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the limitations of, of kind of quarterly numbers coming out, right? It's just it's so much context of where were we a year ago at this exact moment versus where are we today? Obviously, it's really hard for a lot of um, software companies to close large enterprise deals because they're not their sales reps aren't traveling. I mean, when you look at large companies, a lot of the reasons they want to work with uh, direct sales reps is because they're the guy that they get on the phone and they say, hey, I need to do this. Can you help me make this happen? I mean, when you're limited to Zoom calls for that, it's a lot harder to have those direct relationships. And so we've seen a, a, a blip with that. Um, on the other hand, I think that this has kind of given a lot of companies a chance to reevaluate their digital presence. You know, how are we doing our website? Now's the time to double down on things like that. And so the yeah. expectations, yeah. I mean, to your question, I, I think it's kind of a combination of a bunch of things, Dan. I do think that I'm still seeing in the companies that I followed strong top line growth uh, for most, at least enterprise software companies. And a lot of this is interpretation because you know I, I just mentioned it. Strong top line growth is open to interpretation. So you know in, in the retail space, one company might be thirty percent down. Uh, you know there was a point where Starbucks was thirty percent down in sales, but I think pretty universally was looked at as like, wow, they've handled this really well. There have been other companies that have been up, you know, in sales, and people have gone like, well, and I'm guilty of this because I've talked about Kroger a lot. I think Kroger has had tremendous sales because you had to go to Kroger. I don't think in a post-pandemic world, Kroger is gonna compete all that well with Walmart and Amazon, uh, and I'll throw Target in there as well, simply because those companies don't need to make money on groceries, and it's really hard to fight competitors. Uh, but I might be wrong there, but I do think, you know, if you have a, a quarter where Netflix adds 10 million subscribers and the market goes ho-hum, like no, like 10 million subscribers is, I don't know, 18 Fubos, and Fubo was up what? 20% after hours last night because it posted an inconsequential gain in subscribers. And I'm not going to spend more time picking on Fubo, but I just want to use it as an example of companies that people really like. They'll find any reason to be positive about. And companies that have had long-term success, sometimes we look at it and go like, oh, sure, McDonald's sales are uh, exceeding uh, pre-pandemic levels, but yeah, people aren't going to want Big Macs uh, after the pandemic. It can be very 
very strange. Uh, let's take the comment from Connor Murphy uh, before we get into some of the comments from Twitter. Uh, I'm really excited about the companies I own, which makes it easier to brace through a sell-off. Max Chasco, your thoughts here. We talk about this all the time. That's a great point, Connor. And that is, you know, when you buy into a company, it's a business you want to own and you develop a thesis. And, you know, this is uh, gets to like signal versus noise. You know, what happens today before the market close or three Tuesdays from now, it doesn't really matter, right? Uh, it happened, like what, what's going on in the next two years or three years or five years. And if your thesis remains intact, then it doesn't really matter if it's up 30% or down 30% for, at different points in the year, the next two years. Uh, if it's on that great long-term trajectory and has good sound operating metrics or, you know, a, a, at least a path to get there, um, then that's great. And Max, thanks to you, I own a bunch of biotech stocks. And to say they're not doing great is probably putting it mildly. But a lot of the reason these stocks move is vapor. Because you've shown me, okay, with company X, here's the milestone we're looking for. Does it get this approval? Or are, are they able to sell 500 units in, in the field? Or whatever it might be. And when these milestones aren't impacted one way or the other, it doesn't matter if the stock goes up 300% or down 80%, right? Like it's it's really just responding to nothing. Yeah, my my January pick, right? It was a small cap. And um, at the beginning of this year, just all small caps really kind of like had a great run. And people like right after I made the pick, I think it was up like 60, 70% at one point. And people were like, you know, holding parades for me and everything, you know, just trying to make, making me kiss their babies and things. And I was like, hey, 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 slow down. Like this could be down 60 or 70% equally. Like there's no reason for it to be up. And now it's since, you know, kind of correct a little bit. Um, and it doesn't really matter, right? I, I've talked about this. I'll say it again. Uh, I think the nearest term milestone for any pick I've ever made is still like mid 2021. So none of my picks have even crossed their first milestone yet. So it doesn't really matter if they're up or down or anything in between. Uh, and, and if, you know, hopefully uh, they, they reach those milestones and de-risk themselves, they'll earn a higher valuation. And that will be more durable because there's less risk involved. We talked about this earlier in the show. A company sets up a roadmap and your job, our job as analysts, is to see if it's fulfilling that roadmap. And one of the most important things to me is if something falters, if a company you know, comes out, let's say uh, I'll use Starbucks as an example because I talk about them a lot. If Starbucks comes out and says, we expect 2% growth in cold beverage sales and cold beverage is more profitable and it leads to 4% higher food sales and they only deliver a 1% growth, I want them to address what went wrong. If they do, now the, they might come out and say, yeah, we had unseasonably cold temperatures in 60% of our sales territory, and we actually had a 12% spike in hot beverage sales that we just think is an anomaly. If their reason makes sense, I'm still going to see them getting there. Now, if what happens is they come out and say, like, no, like we focus grouped and people hate our cold beverages, well, that's a bigger problem. And that's sort of how it goes in biotech, but to a much more intense degree. It's really relatively easy for Starbucks to tweak a recipe. It's not as easy to uh, redo your cure for cancer or wherever it might be. Simon, you're smiling. I know you want to weigh in here. Oh, yeah. Those, those are great points. And by the way, Max, I, we did get video footage of the parade that I threw for you here in Houston. So I'll put that up on YouTube at some point. Uh, Dan, uh, great, great point. Great point about kind of the operational execution, right? Hold management accountable for what they say they're going to do. No management team is going out there and saying, hey, I'm going to get our stock to have a price to sales multiple of 30, 30 X this year. They're going to focus on the things that they can actually control. And I think that's important for us to remember as investors. Stocks tend to catch up to operational execution. When you look at some of the best performing stocks long term, they tend to have really, really good management. That's not always true in technology. Uh, you do sometimes get some just brilliant visionaries that, that don't execute as well, but usually below them, you have the, your Sheryl Sandbergs of the world. You have your people that are just making sure that everything gets done, that the I's get dotted and the T's get crossed. That's very, very important, especially in restaurants and retail where the margins tend to be you know, micro thin. Uh, with that, Sam Bailey, if we could take the Twitter comment from Greg, it is the first one in the doc. We're going to get to some more of your questions. Uh, Simon, thank you for the great perspective. Can you shed some light with your following? Uh, Simon, you have a following. As to why fear of inflation negatively impacts high growth slash tech stocks so drastically. This isn't new news, so it's fascinating now if it all works, uh, how it all works. Simon, it, if you do have followers, could you not make us wear the matching robes and those like cheap Nikes with the red stripes? Can we be like a much cooler cult if that's where we're going? Duly noted. Thanks very much, Dan. Yeah, sure, certainly will. Uh, this is a great question. I think it goes back, to, um, you know, to the 
to the example of kind of the uh, Greg, we were talking about kind of the valuations for tech companies and how they're so dependent on future cash flows, right? This year, companies that don't have a whole lot of assets in the ground, they're not chemical plants, they're not, you know, railroads, things that you can kind of count on those assets providing a return on uh, on assets today. You're, you're looking to the future. You're saying we're building a software platform that's based upon subscriptions. And we're going to go out and we're going to capture this many customers and we're going to keep this kind of retention rate for them. Or we're going to charge this much money per, per year. And so because so many of those cash flows are in the future and you're discounting those back to the present, um, the people that are true value investors would say, well, the current value of uh, those future free cash flows of the business is what the equity value is today. The intrinsic value of a stock is based upon the future. And so a lot of tech companies that are high flyers, again, they've got in the future. When you discount those back at a higher rate, a higher weighted average cost of capital for the company, if you will, they're worth less today than they were when, when money was free and interest rates were very, very low. And so I think a lot of the volatility in the tech names, especially when you start going through rising rate environments like we're going through right now, is because of that dynamic. There's just kind of an understanding that future cash flows are worth less when inflation's on the table. We're going to take uh, the comment from Deborah Hata next. I apologize if I'm, I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's a little far away from the screen for me to see if you want to throw that one up, Sam. Uh, please share your hedging strategy to members. So I'm going to go first. My hedging strategy is... I have a deep emergency fund. I, I try to keep 12 months of operating expenses in cash. Uh, and I'd say my other hedge is real estate. I've talked a lot about uh, that we're buying a condo. And when we buy our rental condo, we will own that free and clear. So if everything, and the house I'm sitting in now, I own free and clear. This is a very modest manufactured home. We're going to sell this. But I looked at it as when we bought it, if everything went to hell, the world went crazy, nobody wanted financial analysis or journalism or whatever the things that are I could do, and I had to go work at Wawa, I could afford to comfortably live here. So that was my hedge against disaster. I don't hedge with gold or silver. Uh, Max, do you have like a, a pirate's chest somewhere hidden in your in your house full of doubloons or something like that? How do you hedge? Yeah, I left the, uh, the map to Simon in my will. So uh, Simon's going to be <laughs> really rich one day. Um, you know, actually, when it comes to stocks, I don't hedge. I, uh, I my hedge is a long term mindset. You know, volatility doesn't really spook me anymore, uh, especially in in biotech. Right? I was joking internally with the team, like, "Oh, your stocks are down five percent. Yeah, welcome to the club." Um, so, you know, but as you were saying, in terms of like we zoom out and have financial picture overall, uh, yeah, live below your means, have an emergency fund, all those things. Uh, that's a, it helps you sleep better at night when there is you know a pandemic or something that nobody saw coming. A viable hedge for Max also is that I have a guest room. Uh, Simon, how do you hedge? Yeah, I, I would just warn anybody. I mean, hedge funds, are they use a lot of option strategies because they're managing large diversified portfolios. A lot of the hedge funds that you've seen blow up in the last decade or so have been uh, the long tail risks, you know, the things that they couldn't control, the Jurassic Park, you know, the Raptors got through the fences and nobody counted on that because they didn't design it that way. Hedge funds are the same way. You know, we've, we've seen that... Um, kind of throughout financial history, things like that happening uh, as individuals too, it's tempting to get some extra income from the premiums of a covered call or from writing puts out there or doing things that seem really smart at the time. But again, those are priced the way that they are for a reason. Um, I, I, I don't encourage uh, in investors who are new to options to think too hard about hedging strategies. It, there's a lot of risks that are, that are kind of um, beneath the original line of sight with this. I would argue that owning really good companies is a hedge. Uh, there is always going to be value in a really good company. Now, that doesn't mean the stock price won't go down, but if there's inherent value there, you're going to have much more long-term uh, protection. I want to take a comment from Chooch that's in the document. Simon, this is one you didn't really... Uh, well, I, my answer is different from yours. I read the question a little bit differently. Sam, if you want to bring that up... Uh, all your at seven investing picks for May are down. Uh, yeah, we, we don't really worry about that. Understandably, as you were committing to starting those positions on May 1st in the middle of a huge market correction, would you ever consider consider postponing your picks and telling members it's just not the right time to buy now? So here's my answer to this. When we all make our pick, we do factor valuation. That's one of the things in our report. So let's say I was going to pick company X and I don't know, Jim Cramer went on TV and was like, company X is great and go buy it. And it's up 300%. I might go with my second pick because that might 
make it not my highest conviction pick this month. It doesn't mean it's not a stock I like, but maybe something out of the ordinary happened. Or maybe I really like a stock, but there is a little bit of a question as to whether its CEO was, I don't know, friends with Jeffrey Epstein. And like it's, you know, or, or, or uh, a little too close to Bernie Madoff. Like who, who knows? Like some terrible thing. You might go, okay, that is more risk. There, this is a CEO-driven company, and if the CEO gets involved in a scandal, that could be a problem. So we do make adjustments into what we're picking, but I'm not concerned if a company I picked in May is down 20% in May. That doesn't matter to me at all. You know what I'm concerned about? If it was down 10 years from May, that's you know three to five years. That's how I think about it. So yes, we factor in price, we factor in you know, all sorts of outstanding things. But the reality is sometimes things happen that you don't know. Um, right now, we have an abnormal gas crisis that we're going to talk about uh, extensively on Friday's show. Well, gas prices affect the travel industry. They affect, uh, you know, pretty much everything. They affect food prices. They, so right now, there are gas lines in South Carolina. There are shortages. Are these real shortages? No, they're not. They're shortages like we had toilet paper shortages, where instead of buying a two-week supply, people are buying a 10-week supply. Everyone's running out and filling every gas can uh, because there might be a disruption in supply. So that's sort of what we look at. Like If something happens in the short term that, that makes my company not perform as well, that doesn't concern me all that much. Uh, let's take the comment from Clint. Uh, next, and we will keep working through your live uh, comments, the ones in the tour. Max, jump in. Feel free. Yeah, just say Simon. I think we wanted to jump in on the dynamics of the scorecard, if you will. But um, yeah, first of all, well, just for the record, there is one pick from some, but not bragging that is beating the market since <laughs> May. Uh, you know. But um, not look like their name I might have two X's in it, maybe. <laughs> so it's I, important. Oh, go ahead, Dan. I was going to say I believe it's up 003 percent, but hey, <laughs> it's still green, baby. All right. So look, um, like the, the we, we make our picks on the first, so we're not going to change that because we are, again, oriented towards where is this going to be in three years or five years? We're thinking long term. And, you know, in May 2025, it's not going to matter if we've chose our picks on May 1st, 2021 or May 7th, 2021. None of that's going to matter. That's all going to fade away. Um, and it's also different from when you are investing, right, compared to the scorecard. I mean, you can accumulate and buy into positions over time. So you smooth out your average prices, right? Maybe you do that over many months or years. On the scorecard, it's there, it's once, you see it. So, uh, you know, we can't like actively manage the prices. And again, we're not really worried about that. Simon, anything? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's great. And, and kudos to that to that advisor that has a winning pick in May. We won't say any names, but it might, might, name with, might rhyme with Chax Matsko. I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, the scorecard dynamics. I mean, like, Chuch, I, I love your questions when, when you ask these. This is another good one. I, I think that... Um, we are always very confident with, with the picks that we're putting in front of subscribers on the first of the month. And, you know, we'd like to, to have a little bit of a window that if things happen or we see something out there that we really don't like, we can always pull those back and say, hey, you know, we're going to go with this pick instead. We've got a really strong team process that allows us to do that. But in, in terms of like what Max just said, you know, we don't want to start adjusting where it's, ah, it's the price isn't right on the first. We're going to recommend it on the third or the fourth or the fifth. Uh, we want to keep it a, a steady process. But I, I am very confident that our picks are the right picks at the beginning of every single month. Yeah, and it's happened to all of us where your pick is locked in and then like some piece of good news that like you expected to come in the next five years comes like an hour before your pick goes final. Like like that that that's happened to me. In fact, it happened to me with this month's pick, which obviously I can't talk about what the pick is. So we don't worry about the short term all that much. Uh, we are going to take the comment from Cliff. Simon, I'll let you read this one as it's uh, it, it sort of speaks to you a little bit there. Uh, Sam, if you want to bring that back up. Well, you may not be able to bring that back up. Oh, I'm which sorry, one sorry, Cliff, it, I'm sorry, which one do you want to pull uh, up the here? One, the one from Clint. Sorry. Oh, I think, I think okay, Clint. Great. Uh, Clint says, I'm hanging in there with you all. Like my dad always says, never say whoa in the middle of a mud hole. Man, that sounds like a Texas saying right there if I've ever heard one, Clint. Come down here and have a couple of beers with me in Houston sometime. Yeah, I don't even know what a mud hole is, though <laughs> I, I, I could imagine. Uh, Sam Bailey, our director, our, our producer behind the glass here, if you want to bring up Ravi Shah's comment, uh, the Twitter comment in the doc, I think this is an interesting one for Max. Uh, What's the lowest market cap stock you've bought historically or recently? Um, and he's asking about ARK ETFs, but Simon, if you want to talk about ETFs in general, Max, the lowest cap stock I own is whatever pick you made, that's the lowest cap stock. So I'll let you answer here. Yeah, I, 
so there is a lot of risk, right? If you're if you're picking these like very small cap companies, um, I have taken very small, very 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 important to say very small positions in companies with a market cap of like around 150 million dollars, which is very low. That's like by far the lowest I've ever gone. And you know, but I'm a little. It's a little stake, and I think in the long run, if some of my early proto thesis pans out. That'll be a good early position to have, and I can add to it over time as it gets de-risked. But de it's definitely very risky, and those companies are usually trading at a hundred million dollar market cap or something like that for a reason. You know, it's not. Uh, it's like the the penny stock ideas, right? People say it's at a penny now or a tenth of a penny. What happens if it goes to ten dollars? It's not going to go to ten dollars, right? Like so, um, you have to be realistic. Generally, stocks the lower the price. It's like wine, the lower the price the lower the value. And it doesn't mean you can't find a good $5 wine, but if you just go randomly buy 20 of them, you're probably gonna be disappointed 20 times. Like you probably have to buy 100 to find a good one. That used to be a game I played when I had no money and lived in New York. And I found one Chilean wine that was usually around $5 that I liked quite a bit and, uh, and was worth it. And I tried a lot of really bad wine to get there. We're gonna take the comment from Mike Fee. Max, you can see a little better than I can. So I'm gonna let you read this one, the big one, Sam. Yep. There we go. Oh, and Max is reading, but he doesn't appear to have awesome. his Awesome. All right. It's, Mike <laughs> says, it's nearly impossible to, quote, find the bottom, so don't even try. If you own a stock with good fundamentals and it is down a lot, add more if you have conviction, add funds and funds available, uh, and don't lose sleep over it. You don't, quote, make or, quote, lose money, similar to people that check the appreciation of their home's value. It's unlikely you would sell on a whim. Anybody want to take that one? <laughs> Simon, that one's all you. I mean, that that's that's fantastic. That's so insightful, Mike. That's a great comment. That's, that's kind of like the foundation of long-term investing, right? We're not trying to get in and out. We're trying to not trying to make money in a week or a couple of months. We're trying to compound wealth over long periods of time. It takes time to enact strategies for management teams to stick to their word and actually do what they're trying to do out there. Doesn't take just a, a short period of time. So I, that's that's fantastic. Uh, Mike, Mike, you are hired for future segments of our live stream <laughs> show. <laughs> yeah, and like you know, think about it. Like, if you owned a bakery, would you measure your bakery's performance in like weeks or months? Like, probably not, right? So, think of the businesses you own the same way. So, Max, this happens in South Florida where I live. I, I'm in Orlando at the moment or Davenport, but I live in West Palm Beach, and you get out of market money. So, a New York restaurant chain or a national chain will move into West Palm, and they'll open in October. And then November, December, January, February, maybe even March will be blockbuster because we have snowbirds, we have a seasonal population and they don't do anything for the locals. There's no special, why would they have to have specials for locals? Because they're busy. When the, when the snowbird crowd goes away, the locals go, well, I'm not going to that place. They didn't treat me right during the season. And they invariably go out of business. The amount of national chains I've seen fail when local places have courted a relationship with the people who actually live there. And those people go, okay, now it's not crowded. I'm gonna go out to eat twice a week and eat at these places. So you know, this is very much how you have to look at some of these things in the stock market. We appreciate so many of you playing along. This is the only interactive show in the entire uh, investing world. And it's probably not true, but it sounds good to say. It's like, it's like every show that's on now that's live says they're award-winning. And I'm like, I don't really remember what award they gave to the, uh, to the WWE Thunderdome, but apparently it's award-winning. So we're just gonna start handing out awards. We're gonna take a couple more comments here, but I wanted to get to one from David Strauss that's in the doc, because I really think this speaks to mindset and it's a really, really important one. And I am sorry, Sam, that I keep putting you on the spot with these by going a little bit out of order. But uh, if, uh, if that's a tough one to bring it up, I can read it on my phone here. Uh, I've been so conditioned to hold long-term that now when I need to sell a few pieces to fund a kitchen remodel, I feel guilty about selling them off to do it. How do you get past that guilt, even though it adds value to a home and makes your wife happy? Um, that's why you're investing. You're investing so you can afford to do the things you need to do. So if a home remodel is going to make your life better, we've talked about this with homes before, if it's gonna make your life better, and you know what you do every day? You live in your home. Like that is a good reason to sell a stock. That's you're not investing just to win some magical scorecard. This isn't a game, uh, Simon. You've had to do that. Uh, you know, sell, sell stocks in order to to pay for things that are important to you. 
How do you which, is, it which is Dan and Max, right? I got to pay you guys, right? <laughs> it, it was actually something that came up this last year, a funding seven investing. Had to take some money off the table, said, all right, which stocks you know, are, are going to come off of the portfolio? But again, because I knew that was money that needed to be out of the market, that was funding something in my life that was very important right now. I haven't been stressed out this past week, Dan. I say that honestly, that you know, when there's so much red in the portfolio and everyone's saying, oh my gosh, tech stocks are selling off. This is terrible. I say, hey, the money I've got in there, I'm keeping in there for three plus years. I don't worry about that because I know that I've got funded for the things that I need to take care of. So, hey man, buy the uh, buy the kitchen remodel. Make sure that your life is is happy and let the stock market work for you rather than the other way around. And I am taking a little extra money and in investing it, but just just a little because there are some opportunities. And I tell you, when I close on my my new condo, uh, you know, hopefully a little over a week from now, that's the largest sum of money that will ever have sat in my bank account, and it will be there for roughly twelve hours. Do I feel bad about it? No. When I'm sitting on the the faux beach with a perhaps an adult beverage in my hand and you know you know maybe some nachos nearby. I am not for a second going to think, oh, if this money was invested in Tesla, like it would be making me this much money. And like, sure, it would. But the point of money is to enjoy, is to do the things you want to do. So like, you know, do I take money out of my normal investing to fund a vacation? No. Do I set aside money to go on vacation? Absolutely. Do I, you know, part of the reason I'm investing is so I can make some lifestyle choices later in life? Absolutely. We're going to take one more comment from Stock Investor, uh, and then we're going to move into our finisher. Simon has been a trooper uh, getting through this. And I'm going to answer this first so you guys can, can think about it. Uh, hey, guys, what's your favorite earnings report released in the past couple of weeks? I don't remember the timing on it, but my favorite couple of earnings reports, uh, the last two Apple earnings reports have been like a greatest hits of success. Like when you see a company, and I have heavy Apple exposure in my 401k, not in my personal portfolio. But when, when you see a company say, this is what we're going to do, and they do it, and it works across all channels, like usually you get a company go like, here are the 10 priorities we have, and eight of them work, and you're excited. Apple was up double digits, I think more than 20% in every single category. Why is that important? Because one of their major goals was being less reliant on the iPhone, and you could argue they've achieved that. Simon, uh, is there an earnings report you particularly enjoyed? There's a lot of them going on out there. I, I was actually kind of impressed with American Tower. American Tower is is doing exactly what it should be doing, which is consolidating assets across the world. So it just bought up a whole bunch of uh, cellular towers in Europe and in Latin America. Uh, this is an oligopoly. There's only a couple of players in that field that are able to do that and get even more attractive interest rates. Uh, so when people are saying, oh, interest rates are going up, you know, aren't, aren't you worried about a company like that? I'm not. I mean, this is one of the best capital allocators in the stock market. Um, I like to see them taking ad advantage of their advantage out there and, and putting some more money to work this year. And, uh, Max Chatsko, I'll let you weigh in here as well. Yeah, I, I tend to follow stocks that are off the beaten path, so I don't want to telegraph too much of uh, what, what's going on. But I, I did publicly mention on Twitter, I, I bought, I started a position in Invitae, uh, genetic testing company, and uh, the market kind of went the other way on that. But I think, you know, long term, I think this company's uh, on the right path. They think they can grow revenue 60% per year for the next few years. They have a lot of irons in the fire, different uh, parts of the genetic testing markets, right? We think of it as one thing. It's not. Um, so, you know, long term, I mean, I'm not going to bet against Sean George, you know, is it going to be volatile? Yeah. Like, is it every, you know, people love to hate it. People love to love it. It's going to be volatile for the next few years. But uh, uh, I kind of like where it's going. So I started a position uh, right after the earnings report. I own some uh, Invite as well. And that, attest to the power of this team because it's not a company I understand. It is one that I, I, I believe I heard about from you and Manisha Sammy, uh, our, our former colleague and, and, and good friend. And it's one where the argument that you made, you know, in our personal Slack channel is just so compelling, um, you know, that it's absolutely, you know, it, it's absolutely just something I want to own. And do I have big exposure? No, I don't. But I regularly buy stocks that we talk about in our personal Slack channel uh, because I trust this team. Yep. Mike Fee, you are welcome to join me for a drink on our faux beach. Uh, that is a weird thing in Central Florida where they, they just built like a sandy beach over like a lake that's full of alligators that you can't actually go into. Uh, but I want to take one more comment before we close out here. Uh, Nick Steiger had a, good, had a good question, a good comment that I think was worth uh, how do you condition your mind to not be emotionally affected by the numbers on a screen? I'll give my thoughts quickly and then go to Simon and then go to Max. For me, it's remembering this isn't a basketball game. 
it doesn't really matter. There, there's no timetable on it. Like, and I'm a big Celtics fan, and the Celtics have been down by more than 20, some staggering amount, like 22 times this year, and they've won some of those games. Stocks don't work that way. Like, if I fundamentally believe in the company and nothing has changed, I don't care where its stock price sits on any given day. Simon. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the perfect way to say it. Is it, you know, the numbers on the screen are just going to go up and down on a daily, weekly basis. It, it, more interesting is that that's kind of the exhaust of how the car is being driven, right? Let, let's find the right companies out there and, and get into the nitty gritty of uh, some of the softer things that aren't so quantitative about strategies and leadership and R&D projects and markets. And all of that is kind of the neat. It, it, there's a lot more to investing, in my opinion, than just kind of what the stock price tells you on a daily basis. Max, your thoughts here? I guess a simple answer is turn off the screen. We're uh, kind of <laughs> surrounded by technology 24 seven. You got notifications going off. I am militant about controlling my notifications. Nobody except for people on this team and maybe some family members can get to me between the hours of 930 and 930. It's like my quiet time. I don't have social media on my phone. I have investing apps on my phone. I'm just kind of, I disconnect, I unplug and I allow myself to do that. So, you know, again, if you're oriented to the long term, it doesn't matter what's going on today or tomorrow or whatever. I would argue that this team is not good at unplugging, but wow. <laughs> we're generally not talking about, oh my God, this happened at the moment. We might be talking about a television show we're all watching. We might be talking about the market, but if we're doing it, it's in kind of a constructive long-term way. And yes, it might be at 10 o'clock on a Friday night, but it's not, oh God, I can't believe this stock is down 3%. Uh, Simon, I will give you the last word on exhale where we are in the market, remind people that we are long-term buy and hold investors. Oh, so perfectly said, Dan. And, and I'd also like to invite anybody uh, you know, who's been kind of on the fence about joining 7investing, take, take this week, this next week as an opportunity to come check out our platform. 7investing.com slash subscribe is where you can sign up. Uh, I really encourage you to, to sign up this, this coming week and then join us if you're new to 7investing on our subscriber call next Friday. And again, that's where we're going to actually be talking about our specific recommendations. We're going to be talking about our thoughts about these companies. Uh, if you kind of see everything that's going on out there, but you want to get a little bit more into the details and a lot of the questions uh, that were asked here today, we can't talk about those out in public. We, we only talk about our recommendations themselves to our subscribers. But if you want to check those out and di directly interact with us, just kind of like this stream, uh, this live stream that we have right now, but also get a little bit more in detail of the actual recommendations. A great opportunity to do that next Friday. We'd love to have you there. So 7investing is one of the only places in the financial world that's not going to scream about what's happening today. Um, you know, you've, heard, you've all heard me make fun of Jim Cramer before. I, I am not a fan of to buy this, sell this, blah, blah. That is not how we approach investing. But I do think that's largely how the news world covers the stock market. And it's fundamentally incorrect. This went up 10% because some guy rated it a buy whose job is to get on television or get attention or get new customers is fundamentally incorrect. That would be like if instead of reporting on results in sports, we reported on where Vegas set the line and then never actually talked about who won the game. So I, I do think, and I'm a journalist, that they don't teach journalists how to cover this, but it's also, it's not that sexy to go on TV and be like, hey, like, Apple's down 2% after hours on, on good results, but that doesn't actually matter because three years from now, like, like there is a hole you have to fill there. But here's what we're doing next Friday because it isn't just the new subscriber call. Uh, excuse me, it isn't just the subscriber call. At 10 a.m., we have our new subscriber call. That's if you've just joined. We will walk you through the service. We will tell you how to open a brokerage account. Uh, Max does this whole reggae rap thing that's awesome. Matt, human beatbox is behind him. It is fabulous. Uh, there may be fire breathing. Now, there won't be any of that, but there will be some really basic platform build, building for how you use 7 investing, how you enter the stock market. We know it can be scary. We know right now it might be even scarier, but we're not scared. And we are happy to share that with you. Then from 11 to 1230, we will do the call Simon just talk, talked to you about. It is ask us anything with our members. Uh, we'll share our best buys. We will tell you what we're buying right now. We'll do all sorts of cool stuff. And then at 12.30, I will, uh, I will grab a five-hour energy or a Red Bull or who knows what it is. At 12.30, we will do 7 Investing Now live for all of you at a special time. It is a very exciting and long day, and I will sleep for an entire nine hours after that, which is about six hours more than I sleep on a regular night. With that, Simon has made it through the show. Sam Bailey, let's hit our finisher. What are you most worried about? 
44.6% of you said tech stocks, 6.1% said gas prices, uh, 30% said inflation, 20.4% said the pandemic. Um, I'm not worried about tech stocks, not, not good ones. I think there are some companies that people were betting on that maybe weren't inherently good companies. There, there are some companies you've heard me talk about um, you know, that I'm not a big fan of. Uh, one that I use every day, I, I play cards on skills all the time. I just think it's a pretty easy to duplicate platform that, that maybe is never gonna hit you know, this, this massive stride. But for the most part, I'm actually most worried about the pandemic because, well, let's not get political. Just go get vaccinated, people. Like, like we all wanna do stuff. Like I will buy you a beer if you see me if you got vaccinated because you saw this show. Like I, I, I want to be with humanity again. The fear of that not happening is by far the thing I'm afraid of the most. Simon, aside from making it through the day uh, with, without passing out, what are you, what, which, which one on this list bothers you the most? Yeah, D, D the pandemic, final answer, Dan. I'm locking that one in, yep. That uh, Max Chatsko, I know weaponized murder hornets are a concern, but uh, beyond that, which of these are you worried about? Murder hornets are getting out of control, Dan. Um, that is crazy. No, I, I guess the pandemic. I'm not much of a worrier. I mean, uh, but I guess for the same reasons you guys pointed out. Although I get my second shot on Friday, so woohoo. Uh, Max, the youngest person on the team, I also believe the last to get vaccinated. I'm not 100% sure that's true, but I, but I am pretty sure that is true. With that, it was an honor and a privilege to do this show. Um, we know, and I've talked about it, a lot of red in the board, a lot of red in your portfolio, that's scary. The fact that you're willing to be here with us and ask us to help you get through this, that is not something we take lightly. Is it, you know, This is probably a show I've been thinking about and working on for a couple of days because, and my earpiece just fell out, because this is so important. You know, This is your money. This is your life. This is your retirement. Never for a second think that this is anything other than ultra serious to us. We have a really good time. We like each other. We like a lot of you. Uh, we know a lot of you personally. Oh yeah, Max is a little prickly there. But that being said, just because we're, we're lighthearted and positive and having a good time doesn't mean we don't understand the gravity of the situation. And we, it's, a, it's again, it's a privilege that you've chosen to turn to us and that so many of you have chosen to be members. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can do that. Uh, at info at seveninvesting.com. If you want to meet Max in person, he will be at the Starbucks on the corner of uh, Jim Miller Lane. Now, I have no idea where Max is going to be. Um, info at seveninvesting.com. That's where you send us email about membership questions, about our service, about uh, what time is that special thing you were talking about going to be. If you want to interact with us, at Seven Investing shares a lot of our personal tweets, a lot of our company tweets. Uh, I, I can tell you right now, I, I put out a lot of financial tweets, but I also put out a lot of silly tweets. I believe I am on a watch list from Comcast from, from tweeting so often. And I actually have some amazing podcast content coming up. Uh, Simon, do you want to tease uh, your friend who I'm talking with tomorrow? Uh, you know him a little better than, than, than I do. Help me out, Dan. What's the conversation? Oh, oh you're going to talk about customer loyalty with Barry Kirk. Yes, of course. Yeah, sure. Right up your alley, retail customer loyalty. I mean, hot topic and an expert from the industry. I'm talking about that one. I am so excited to have that conversation with someone whose job it is, is to help companies build customer loyalty. I also did a short interview yesterday uh, with the managing director of the American Customer Satisfaction Index, and we talked about travel. Really interesting. During the pandemic, people actually like airlines more. And that's largely because airlines became more like Southwest. They had to get flexible. They had to start sort of treating you better. And they like hotels less. Why? When you go to a hotel and the restaurant's closed and the pool is empty, you're not going to be as happy. We're going to get into that in much greater detail. I'm not sure when we're going to air that. Probably after the show one day next week. I'm also taping a ton of stuff with Anurban Mahante on Thursday. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Simon Erickson. Thank you, Sam Bailey. We will see you on Friday.